And it's live. At least I think it's live. I don't know if it's live or not. But we're having fun with this in the meantime. There we go. That's better. Hey guys, I was showing, whoops, oh my god, I'm terrible at this. I can't do opposites. Hey, look at that. Isn't that cool? Hi, Tim. Hi, Leon. How are you? Hey, Billy. Hi, you're, how are you? Don't you just, dang it, I suck at this. I can't do opposites. It's like mirror image, I stink. Anyhow, my buddy, big dog leather, Tim. Burned this on a uh, piece of wood for me. I think it's pretty epic. I love this. So you'll probably be seeing that a little bit in the future. Hi, Cajun man. How's things over in Ireland, Leon? They're more wintry here. We finally got snow and ice and sleet and a little bit of everything here. I'll wait till a few more people come in if anybody does. Yeah, isn't that, that's, this, this totally is awesome. Totally loving this. God. <laughs> but I suck at showing it off. Holy cow. Yeah, that way. There we go. <laughs> hey, old Chevy 4 by 4 Good to see you, man. How's things down south? Eight inches of snow. Wow, you got way more, but you're, you're by the... You're by Lake Erie. Um, we only got a couple inches here, and it snowed, and then it quit, then it sleeted, then it snowed, then it sleeted, and then there was freezing rain. So now it's just slippery. But today it actually got above freezing, so the main roads are all good. Hi, Abel Lock and Key. Welcome. So um, today is going to be a little bit of a question and answer. A couple people did put in uh questions not that many though and uh then i was going to talk about 10 things you shouldn't do in your kitchen and uh, then we're going to talk a little bit about fats like butter and lard and uh, shortening and margarine hi david welcome so uh let's see here and this is this is way 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 overdue, like months overdue. And I was going to do this a long time ago, um, but my schedule and the weather didn't permit. And I had never even ended up being able to camp this year, this past year because of all the stuff going on. But I'm going to show you something else. Oh my God, I stink at this. There we, <laughs> there we go. So this was also made for me by Big Dog Weather. And the inside was made by... DIY dark matter and it is a ferro rod and striker set and I want you to look man I stink at this stuff I want you to look there at how pretty that is just look at that isn't that awesome I can't wait to use that in the matching striker can't wait to use that here this uh this coming summer for some cast iron cooking and at the campfire. But just look at the work on this. And he put a, 
I asked him to put a loop on the back here because I actually want to be able to attach it to my saddle when I'm actually out in the trail and out in the woods, 20 miles from home <laughs> in the woods on my horse. So there you can see it again, but it's pretty cool. Isn't it? I think it's pretty awesome. I, I love it. And he did, he did this for me. Um, he actually found this for me. I'm kind of a, a, I love trees and have a lot of um, spiritual ties to trees, sort of. I don't know if that's my uh, Seneca Nation background or whatever, but um, that's sort of where he came up with the idea with this guy. And I just, I love it. <laughs> Leon, if that was the case, we probably wouldn't be together today. Size matters. That's all I'm saying. Uh, no snow, but wind chills in the 20s right now. Yeah, the wind, wind is really still bad. It's been bad all weekend, but it's still pretty darn cold. Um, yeah. Oh, I'm so excited for this year to actually maybe be able to use some of my vacation for me this year and uh, to actually do some Dutch oven cooking out in the campfire. You know, guys know I like cooking with wood, and so I'm really looking forward to that this year. Yep, the Celtics. Celtics Green Man. Isn't he awesome? I love him. Uh, so, well, go over here some of the question and answers, I guess. Uh, one, one of the questions I actually got was if I make my own sausage. Um, back growing up, my family made our own sausage. And they asked what went in it. And mom, I remember it being peppery. And mom told me it was, she would have to look up the recipe because it was a mix of so many pounds of um, pork sausage, fresh sausage. And then she would add um, pepper and some other spices. Caraway st sticks in my mind, pepper and caraway. And I'm not sure what else. She was going to look for the recipe though. We haven't used it in years because we haven't done our own butchering in a long time. So that was one of the questions. Um, how did I learn to cook? I think that was yours, Billy. Um, I grew up with parents that cooked. Both my parents cooked and um, my grandparents cooked and I grew up cooking. And back then we didn't have a microwave. You wanted to eat, you cooked. <laughs> so um, cooking was an important thing to learn. <laughs> but I loved it. I can remember... Well, I started baking when I was seven and I might've been even younger than that when I, because I had a mom had a step stool for me to be able to reach the stove and do dishes. So I was pretty young. Hi Stace. Hi Allie. Welcome. So I was pretty young when I learned to cook. And of course, mom and dad were a big influence. They both cooked. Actually, my father taught my mother how to cook. My mother is a good cook. Um, but when they got married, she didn't know how to cook. Her mother, my grandmother, uh, was actually somewhat of a gourmet cook, and I probably get this bug from her, but she was very territorial, and she did not teach her girls to cook. Um, she didn't let them in the kitchen. So mom didn't have that skill set until she married dad, but dad knew how to cook, and he was a fabulous baker. He made the best bread. Oh, my goodness. So, um, hi, Steve. Hi, Susie. Um, thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, if you haven't checked out Bandana Grandma, that's a good channel to check out. All of the people in here have good channels. Strong's Adventures, he does a lot of Dutch oven cooking too, and they get to go to some cool places, and they like the amusement parks and stuff like I do. Um, Big Dog Leather, of course, you've seen his handiwork with the leather, and now he's doing some wood burning. Um, Stace Makes does wood churning. Um, but uh, Bandana Grandma, she made the most amazing mittens felted mittens oh my god they're gorgeous they're works of art just love them so anyhow so I learned to cook from my parents and had that bug early on I can remember being like eight or nine years old and uh actually making little menus for making breakfast and stuff and <laughs> giving it like I was running a restaurant <laughs> and um at the time on tv we only got like four channels being in the country actually three and a half because sometimes the fourth one came in and sometimes it didn't. But on channel 44 was Julia Child. And so I grew up watching her. And she was a big inspiration and kind of uh, somebody I aspired to be able to cook 
half as well as someday. I am not there yet, <laughs> but we always try. So, oh yeah, that's cool, Cajun. Um, Billy, I'm not even going to address the whole pancakes on a Dutch oven lid thing. Just not. <laughs> but we might revisit it this summer. Just saying. There might be something in that. <laughs> what spices do I use the most? Oh, I'm going to say, let's see. Well, you guys know I like my Montreal seasoning mix. I use garlic. I use pepper. I use little salt. Um, I like paprika. I like um, my Cajun blend and um, chili spices also. Um, oh, depending on the salads, I like using celery seed. Um, there are a lot, a lot of things, but those are probably the ones that, oh, and Italian seasoning. Italian seasoning, which is, you know, your, your mix of um, uh, basil and oregano. I, I like that a lot too. I use that a lot. Um, <laughs> yeah, Big Dog Leather. He has a friend, Hajib, that makes unbelievable pancakes. Unbelievable. Edible? Questionable. But unbelievable? Yes. Um, so that's probably the biggest thing in the, in the spices. Um, when I'm baking, a lot of the things that I bake, I like uh, using um, cinnamon, nutmeg, sometimes mace, cloves, uh, especially ground cloves. So, I mean, it depends on what, what you're making, but I use those quite a bit too. Those seems to be kind of a staple in some of the baked goods that I make. Um, this one, this one, I don't even know how to answer. What is my favorite dessert to make? Boy, I don't even know. Um, creativity wise, I probably, I, I don't even know, you know, they've all got their own challenges. <laughs> um, I, I, I like stuff that I can be creative with. So, um, you know, I, I would say like maybe some of the torts and the pies. Um, I, I can't even think. I mean, if I like to eat it, I like to make it. <laughs> so I, I can't really narrow that down. That's kind of a broad, broad spectrum. Um, so I don't know how to answer that. dough to make pecan bites oh my god that sounds awesome um one of the things i like um, are the italian sour cream cookies oh those are delicious too um and eclairs and cream puffs and all kinds of pies and torts and creme brulee and cheesecakes and yeah this is a this is a bad road to go down <laughs> Flannel texture pancakes or the velvet pancakes. Oh, yeah, I know what you're talking about. Yeah, I agree with you on that, Bandana Grandma. Hi, Mel Mel. Welcome. Hi, Jojo. Hi, glad to see you here. Thanks for stopping in. Check Jojo out. She has some really cool birds that go with her all over the place. And uh, she's a fellow Pennsylvania peep. So I like supporting my fellow Pennsylvanians. You guys know that. So um, let's see. I was going to talk about 10 things not to do in the kitchen. These are really simple things, but I, I think, you know, our, your parents did them and you just learned them that way and you just took it for granted. That's how it should be. Um, Really didn't eat yet. This probably isn't going to go well for you then. <laughs> so um, one of the first things, people don't preheat their ovens. Preheating, now I want pancakes. Yeah, that makes two of us. Uh, I didn't have lunch yet. <laughs> I did have a good breakfast though. Um, people don't preheat their oven. Preheating ovens is really important. Why is it important? Because the baking times 
of, especially when you're doing baked goods where it's more of a precise science, relies on exact timing to allow the reactions to occur in what you're baking. So if you don't have your oven preheated, then it's not going to be at the right temperature to help make that reaction happen to bake. So it's not going to turn out right. Um, you know, that's, that's one of the big things. Hi, Vanessa Kitty. Welcome. So preheating your oven is important. Um, I don't, I've always done that. I mean, I always start preheating my oven when I start getting my prep ready. So it's always ready to go. Um, oh, Allie, I hate you. I, I gotta, I'm so hungry for that. I think that's going to happen this week. I haven't uh, had my bagels and lox with capers and red onion in a while and Philly cream cheese. Oh yeah, baby. You guys are making me hungry. Dang. That's supposed to be my job. Um, number two tip not to do in the kitchen. When you're measuring out flour, I think most people dip and then take a knife or whatever and swipe off to level it out. So two reasons. One, that's actually more than the actual measure. And two, you're packing it down. So it's uh, more dense flour is calling for when you do that, which will make a denser product when you're done. You're actually to pour it in to the proper measure. <clears throat> the flavor clumps. <laughs> um, number three tip not to do. So many people do this and it's so tempting. It's so tempting. And that's overfilling a pan. Uh, like you have several cutlets of meat and you try and get them all smooshed in the pan or uh, stirring things too much. That happens a lot too. If you keep stirring it, it never has time to do its job. So, and you also can break it down. So it might not end up being the texture or consistency that you want. So um, leave it alone, put it in, check it occasionally, but leave it alone. Um, number four, not letting your meat rest. This is a big one, okay? So when you're cooking meat, the meat takes up all, those, all that juice, okay? And if you don't let it rest and you cut it, all the juices inside that meat run out. You need to let the meat rest to allow the meat to be able to take those juices back up. And that way, when you cut your meat after five to 10 minute resting, 10 minute resting is often considered one of the best, depending on how big your cut of meat is. Um, then you'll have a nice juicy cut. One of the biggest things, and this drives me crazy, people that have stuff stuff in uh, roasters and stuff, and every every little while they're opening it, and poking it, stabbing it, and you see all the juice. You're going to have dry roasts or turkeys or whatever you're doing every time if you do that because you're you're <laughs> you're putting holes in it and all the juice runs out. So it's not going to be able to stay moist. Um, number five, rinsing meat before you prepare it. I think a lot of people do this, especially getting grocery store meat. Um, but they'll rinse it off to get the slime off. Um, <laughs> so, but you shouldn't do that um, because when you do that, you're spreading all kinds of bacteria all over the place and then your sink and everywhere else. Um, so you're not, and you're not really supposed to have to rinse your meat off. If you have to rinse your meat off, that's probably a bad sign. Um, this one I was guilty of for quite a while. <laughs> And that was using nonstick pans at high heat with metal utensils. Yes, I was guilty of this. Um, sometimes it was just because I didn't think because I also use cast iron and I also use stainless, which you can use the metal utensils with, um, but not with not with high heat with the nonstick because that to start the metal can scratch and degrade the surface and then you're getting all those chemicals from the Teflon which is not good and to be honest um, I've always used my cast iron I always had stainless but several years ago I got rid of I still have I have the master clad which is ceramic which is a ceramic uh, coating over stainless um, 
but all the other nonstick stuff I got rid of because I don't think it's healthy. And I don't want that stuff. Number seven. Marcial, you're a cast iron cook. And, and Billy, you tell me what you think about this. I'm going to give you my thoughts on it. <laughs> yes, dear. Good to know. <laughs> Anyhow, cooking acidic foods in reactive pans. And for the most part, that's speaking to aluminum pans, which I have no part of. I don't have any time for aluminum pans, unless they are a well-coated aluminum pan, like a lot of the uh, Copper Chef series is, the, the copper ones. They are um, coated with the copper metal coating, um, so you're not getting the aluminum. But regular aluminum pans, like they were really prevalent when I was growing up in the 70s. I know a lot of people had it. My mom was cooking in cast iron mostly, so I was pretty lucky. But aluminum is uh, reactive, and so is cast iron to acidic foods. So storing foods in them or cooking foods in them can be problematic because you can wear away at the metals and get those metals. So some people say you shouldn't do tomatoes in cast iron. I pretty much say that's bull because if you have well-seasoned cast iron, you're not going to damage it just by cooking it. Now, the caveat is as soon as you're done cooking it, clean it out. You know, you, you wipe it out, clean it out, and um, I re, re put a sheen of oil on it, and it's fine. Um, storing tomatoes in it? No. But cooking in them? Yeah, I don't have a problem with cooking, like, tomatoes and stuff and, and cast iron. Some people do. Um, I don't. But once again, my pans are well-seasoned. That's why you have them well-seasoned. Number eight, blending hot liquids without taking the stopper out. Most people have probably been guilty at this at one time or another. I know I did it when I was young and stupid. Um, <laughs> didn't know any better. But uh, doing hot liquids in a blender and you don't have the stopper off builds pressure. And if it builds too much pressure, it can go boom all over the place. And besides making a mess, if the stuff's hot, you're going to get burnt. It's it's not a good situation. Um, I learned from a mistake a long time ago. Um, let's see, number nine, using Pyrex dishes underneath a broiler. So Pyrex is glass, it's hot, it's tempered glass and it's good to a certain temperature, but under a broiler or direct heat or direct heat on a stove, like a gas stove or even a electric stove um, will break your pans. And people who have tried it, it's not been a good thing. And I mean, it, it can be actually pretty explosive too, depending on how it shatters. Um, so definitely not a good thing. I love Pyrex, but it's a time and a place for it. And high heats and direct heats aren't it. Um, number 10, over mixing batters. Um, and I think this is a an easy... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Billy, so you do the same thing I do. Yep. And I, like I said, I think that's perfectly acceptable. Um, ooh, yeah, that's, hey, I did it. That was one of those live and learn. I mean, when I didn't, I didn't, I knew some stuff, but information was a lot more limited back, back when Billy and I were, were young on some of this stuff. And and I was raised, I was raised on a farm, not in a culinary arts kitchen. So I didn't know all these scientific principles yet. So some of this was trial and error. <laughs> and it's like, ooh, that wasn't good. Guess I won't do that again. So number 10, overmixing batter. This is really tempting to do. And mechanical, too much mechanical mixing separates the gluten from the flour. And that makes your baked goods more tough. So you know, it's, it, you want to, you want to get this stuff mixed, but once you have it well incorporated, stop. Over mixing can just pound it down and, and make it a really dense product. <laughs> Was Rhonda happy with you, Billy, <laughs> when you did that? All right. <laughs> Well, that was more trial and error, wasn't it, Billy? So, uh, where is 
where is the one piece I want here? I've, I, if you watched my, um, I think it was in my red cabbage video that was out this past week. How much wood can a woodchuck chuck? As much as a woodchuck can chuck wood. Um, I was talking about a blogger. And she actually started her blog the same year that I started my channel. I didn't know about her then. <laughs> See, I had an answer for you, Keith. <laughs> so I talked about a coal cracker in the kitchen. Lori grew up um, not far from me in Schuylkill County. And she was a real deal. And some of her stuff is really deep coal region uh, cooking. And she shared a recipe here um, about two weeks ago, maybe maybe a week ago. And it's called, it's Smollett's. Smollett's is a lard spread. Yeah, like spread on your toast and stuff. And usually we'll add different things to it. But it's a, it's a spread, and it was a high-fat spread, obviously. But there was a reason for it, because when a lot of the uh, people that came to this country, stuff wasn't as, as prosperous here as they had hoped. And here in the, in the coal region, I mean, the miners took a beating. Um, they had to work. I don't know if you know this or not, but like we're close to Jim Thorpe and stuff where uh, the Molly Maguires were and the miners really took a beating. They basically were held captive in a way like indentured servants um, because stress molds. Are... <laughs> oh my God, Keith, you're not right. Um, they took a beating because they had to work for the coal mine and they had to buy all their own supplies for their jobs. So like, for example, um, a blaster, he had to buy all his own uh, cord, blasting caps, powder and everything else. And he had to buy it from the company store and their housing. They had to rent from the company. The company owned the, owned the whole town. Everything that you wanted they had monopoly on. There was no outside um, vendors or purveyors or businessmen. Everything was owned by the company. And they kept everything priced just high enough that those people could never even hardly scrape, even let alone get ahead to ever go anywhere else or do anything else. And it was a harsh life. If uh, your man, if, if your husband died in the coal mine on the job, They'd come, drop his body off on the porch, and if you didn't have somebody to fill his spot the next day, like a son, uh, to fill his spot the next day, you were out. You had to go find new housing. You were homeless. Uh, it was rough. So there was a lot of reason why the stuff like the Molly Maguires happened in our area and everything. But So this was a tough life, so whatever they had, they had to make go as far as possible. Um. Let's see here. I don't want to miss anything. Yes. Yeah, Tim was saying there was actually company currency, and that is absolutely correct, which didn't do you any good anywhere else. So if you ever wanted to get out of it, you couldn't. You were really trapped. So <clears throat> railroads also played a part in that, too. That was There was quite a lot of that. So anyhow, back to Smollett's and large spread. Um. You actually can make it taste pretty pretty decent. And I know a lot of people are going, oh my God, lard. Ah. But it actually was pretty decent. I didn't I didn't grow up using lard spread because we had lard. We we did our own butchering and stuff, but we also had a dairy farm and we had the real beautiful gold butter. So with me, you know, we it was butter. Uh, we saved the lard for uh, frying and pastry, basically. So 16 tons. <laughs> Another day older and deeper than amen to that. Yep. So in the history of these foods, a lot of people today, you know, a lot of the young people today don't understand why these foods were a necessity. Um, you know, the people back then, they were working really demanding physical hard labor jobs. So they needed a lot of energy and they needed to do it as cheaply as possible. And there wasn't a whole lot of groceries to go around. So preserving was big and making the most of what you had was big. 
And you want to remember that we were coming out of uh, the wars and the Great Depression. So that that was really a big thing. And, and out of World War II, the industrialization started. And that was when all the fake stuff started to come out. And enter margarine. So during the war, you had such a high demand to feed our troops that synthetic everything was made. That's, you know, our synthetic medicines came to be. Uh, started coming out then because we didn't have enough natural stuff to treat everybody. And uh, the same started happening with uh, foods as well. And then there was also the preservation issue to keep it preserved and being able to ship it to troops or who needed it. So that was all part of the equation. So that got me thinking about the whole villainization of real fats so you have butter, you have butter's big sister, lard, and then you have margarine, the imposter, and you have shortening. Shortening is actually considered to be all fats and oils, but we are so conditioned with the marketing of all, most of my life anyway, that if you say shortening, you think Crisco. Have they done a good job or what in branding? So um, you can interchange shortening. Crisco with lard, but that's it. So let's talk a little bit about each of these. Butter is 80% fat. Um, it adds flavor and it makes your baked goods very tender. And it contains nutrients not found in other foods. Um, it contains vitamin K2. Um, it contains omega-3 fats. It contains... Conjugated linoleic acid, which is a fatty acid that actually can help inflammation in your intestines and uh, helps fight against cancer. And uh, it also has butyrate, butyrate which fights um, intestinal inflammation as well. Um, let's see here. 1970s is when butter started getting a bad rap and they started really pushing margarine. OK, um, that's when everybody said, oh, butter's going to kill you and it's going to kill your heart and blah, 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 blah. Well, since then, you know, it's funny how these things go in cycles, because now all of a sudden, oh, yeah, butter's not as bad as we thought. Imagine that. Oh, yeah, everybody, everybody had we had a big uh, tin tin pail for our lard. And then we also had the bacon fat. That was in another <laughs> another thing. You know, it's funny you mentioned that um, about the frosting. I don't care for frosting made with shortening, lard, butter, and sparing amounts because it has a waxy. I think it's, it's thing. I think it's the texture. It's more waxy. I like my um, I like my frostings more like like whipped or very creamy. And uh, so I'm not a fan of the stiffer lard and shortening and butter-based frostings. So I tend not to make them that as nearly as much. Um, so then we get to lard. Lard is rendered fat, fat that you cook down and render. And it's basically considered butter's big sister. Um, it makes very tender baked goods and it's less rich than butter. Um, so I talked about, oh, and the other thing about shortening, shortening is 100% fat. So it's actually worse fat-wise than butter is. Um, and shortening also usually contains, it's, it's made out of veggie oils like cottonseed and soybean oil. Um, but it's all veggie oil and 100% fat. But your mom, yeah, your mom's cooked icing is, is different than that. So, you know, that's, the, and that's, that's a milk, that's actually a milk icing. And that's, the cooked icing is actually a cooked milk icing, which is really good. Very creamy, delicious, totally delicious. I've made that. I think that was on the red, that I made that with the red velvet cake for um, Valentine's Day a couple years ago. I have a vid out on it. I like, yep, I like cream. Oh, yeah. Who doesn't like cream cheese frosting? And like pumpkin rolls with cream cheese. 
Yeah, baby. Dang, you're making me hungry. Knock it off, guys. All right, back to the villain, Margarine. So in the 70s, we started, they started this heavy campaign of selling margarine and how it was super healthy for us and way better than butter and whole foods. So one should always wonder when, when these campaigns of health and stuff happen, it's always wise to look at who funds said research. Uh, because a lot of times there's people to gain from it. And in the end, it's not the consumer. If some of this stuff was so good that they push on us, then why don't they want it on labels? Why do they want to take the consumer's right away to know what we're paying for and what we're eating? That's always a good, good question. So margarine was really started pushing the seventies and it's hydrogen added to vegetable oil. That right there should be enough like, Ugh. but anyway, um, it has, it's 35% fat. So yes, it's a lot less fat, but, but it's not reliable for baking goods because why? It doesn't have the fat. And two, the other thing with it is, is that one of the side, the hydrogenization uh, increases saturated fat, which is good, but it makes, as a side result, trans fats. Trans fats are bad. Margarine also contains additives like colorization, which um, actually some people are allergic to. Um, so you got to be careful with that stuff. <laughs> Flies won't even eat margarine and mold won't even grow on it. Yep. Totally true. So it's got to make you wonder. And, and don't get me wrong. I mean, as we've gone through life, I went through 20 years of diet crap about all the stuff in, in the world and did all the crap. Um, Mike and I both did at certain aspects. I learned a lot. I learned a lot. And when I started doing research and, and papers and stuff, actually, when I was getting my degree, I learned a lot more because then I started studying GMOs and everything else. And it was very enlightening how something that started out nobly didn't end up that way. So anyhow, uh, besides the colorization, which some people are actually can be allergic to, um, and it causes inflammation. Also, they also will add emulsifiers, which are more byproducts that you don't need. People can choose to do what they feel is best for their health and, and what they think are going to get results. Um, I will never judge that. Everybody is different. Everybody reacts different. But I am tired of whole foods taking a hit when really the reason you have imitation stuff was to make a lot of money. Certain companies that make that stuff make a lot of money. And the consumer, it's not about their health. It's about somebody making a lot of money. And it's not you. Um, the only reason we have substitutes is because we hit crises of, of population and war and whatnot where we didn't have enough to feed of the real stuff. And as farming and agricultural change, you know, that's like the, this whole plant-based crap. This whole plant-based crap gets me because <laughs> now they're pushing, you know, like the, the incredible burger, you know, plant-based. I got news for you. My cows, they eat plants. I consider it plant-based. I'm good. My venison, plants, plant-based. But the thing of it is, is doing this and trying to get people hooked and accepting the fake stuff changes the agriculture as we know it. Once again, who benefits, who benefits from, uh, you know, something like the Incredible Burger and the plant-based stuff? Well, it's a certain aspect of agriculture, but it's not the family farmer. No, it's the big, it's the big um, corporate farmer, which are big corporations, which are millionaires and tied into usually GMO companies. And they're the ones that have something to gain. So that's a concern. I'm, it also is a big thing of it's affecting the other aspects of agri agriculture with livestock. That's important. You need that whole chain. And if one of those links is gone, the rest of it is going to be out of balance. So I, I worry that people fall for that. But it's been something that, you know, over the past 
30 years anyway, has been a steady, steady uh, education and propaganda. Whole, and that's why, I mean, we try not to eat processed foods that much because of, there's so much preservatives and so much crap in them. And, and you know, stuff isn't going to spoil and degrade right away. That means it's probably not that good for you. I remember watching a study. Uh, I don't know if it was 60 Minutes or something one time. And they actually held uh, like um, like the fries from the fast food joints and they had different ones. And like the one, the one uh, meal combo they left set out. And it did not spoil in three months. I'm like, if it doesn't break down that way, it's not going to break down your body either. So that's probably not too good for you. But who doesn't want a burger now and then? So there is that. Everything in moderation. So anyhow, just want to do a, a quick live stream. I have some stuff coming up. Um, I'm taking requests again, and I was reminded by one of my other subscribers the other day that he's still waiting for um, sour broughton and spetzel, and another one's waiting yet for pierogies, so maybe I'll start working on that here in the next week, and we'll see how it goes. Um, I made uh, pumpkin bread the other day, and that's probably the next video out, depending on whether I get myself in gear for a cast iron Wednesday. So we'll see what happens. Hi, Deb in Vegas. Welcome. Oh, thank you. Yeah, Blind Views. He has an awesome channel. And he's a fellow Pennsylvanian. So he's awesome. So um, so that's really it. If you guys are, you know, if there's stuff that you want to add to the request list of do you want vids coming up on, let me know. Um, the, the, I'm hoping this... Summer, like I can get some Dutch, but I had a killer three months work schedule, which is why stuff was more sparse than I would have liked. Um, but I finally got some time off. I had to take how sad is I had to take vacation to get any days in a row off. <laughs> so because it's been crazy since October. So um, that was pretty much all I wanted to go over. I don't know if this was interesting or not, but if you're a food person. It's interesting to me. I always, I'm always interested. I, I love Alton Brown as a chef because I love the science and the high and the how and why we do what we do with with food. So, anyhow, I think I'm gonna wrap this up. And uh, but I thank everybody that came out, and uh, I thank everybody that supported my channel. I didn't really think I'd be where I'm at going into it. Um, so pretty pleased. And I thank all of you because you guys, I really appreciate that. Um, so like I said, drop me a line if there's stuff you want to see. It always helps me with ideas and uh, or stuff you want talked about down the road. So other than that, I hope you guys stay warm and uh, enjoy your weekend, long weekend. Enjoy it. And uh, until the next time, bye.